My lab is actually known for developing a technology that has allowed us to access spaces inside of our cell that no one's been able to access before uh, in order to tell us what is the chemical composition of these small little bodies that are present inside of our cells. So these are little compartments that are called organelles. And just like organs of the body perform very specific functions for our body, organelles inside cells perform very specific functions for cells. And for a long time, people had no idea what was contained inside organelles, right? Why is it that um, some organelles actually break down proteins into amino acids and other organelles stitch up amino acids into proteins? You're doing completely opposite things, right? Yet, they all are like a little bubble of, of fat membrane surrounding, uh, surrounding a space inside. And as a chemist, I'm looking at these little compartments and saying, they're all still in the same environment, which is the cytoplasm of the cell, right? Yet, these two compartments are doing completely different kinds of biochemistries. So what is it that inside the environment makes these two things that look similar perform such different functions? And so in order to solve that problem, my lab developed a technology by which we could go and measure the levels of different ions present inside the spaces enclosed by the membranes that form these little organelles, right? And so this is what our lab was known for, or actually is known for uh, across the world, uh, that we've been the first to be able to go and actually show what is the level of each different ion inside, say, an organelle like the lysosome, or another organelle like the Golgi, etc. But quietly over the pandemic, this technology that was actually built to, um, to look for new biology inside cells, right? To understand something new about cells, somehow mutated and changed into a technology that actually has maybe some practical application, which is to turn cold tumors hot, right? It looks like it can be used to treat a variety of cancers, right? Now this, this change, right, was never planned, right? So in fact, I remember I was giving a talk somewhere, uh, uh, in a, in an, somewhere in Caltech, and somebody in the audience, you know, 10 years ago, uh, put up their hand and said, can you use this technology uh, for drug delivery? And I remember distinctly saying into the mic, I am not interested in doing anything useful, right? I want to just understand how cells work. I will let disease be cured by all the surgeons and the clinicians. That's not my job, right? And so uh, from there to reach the point where this technology is actually going to be useful in, in curing cancers, at least in mice, uh, uh, was not a, a very logical, um, uh, a straightforward journey. And you know, Bill Gates said that it's really hard to connect the dots to see where you're going, because very often, in fact, most of the time, you can only connect the dots when you're looking back, right? So what I thought I'll do today is tell you how this journey actually started, right? Um, and where we ended up today, where we see this technology might be useful uh, in, for biomedical applications. Uh, so let's get started. And um, I have to go forwards, right? And so, as I said, I said I would never be, I would never do anything useful. And that is what I mean by uh, having some good intentions. Uh, I mean, my road to hell, because I said I would never do anything useful. But I wanted to actually do basic biology, simply understand how cells work, right? And so, um, when I started my lab at NCBS, and the first person who actually believed in me and gave me a job to start at this place, actually sitting right there. Uh, and I'm here, <laughs> don't look back, it's you, <laughs> is Vijay. Uh, and I'm here today because he said, I think you should come and talk to some young students. Uh, and so, because he was able to recognize something in what we were doing, uh, I feel that this man actually has the capacity to recognize that in everybody. So I think I'm talking to an audience of very special 
uh, uh, individuals. So when I started in his institute in 2005, I was asking a question that was of fundamental interest and had no sort of obviously practical application to anyone, even me, right? Uh, and so that technology has now turned that, that simple question has now given rise to a technology that can turn what are called cold tumors into things which are hot. So let me just describe for you what a cold tumor is and what a hot tumor is. So you and I get cancer every day. In fact, some of us are getting cancer right now, right? But our immune cells are able to recognize a cell that has just turned cancerous because it's, it looks strange, right? It's not a normal cell. And your immune cells are able to basically see the cell as being a strange cell and obliterate it, right? Now, um, there is, so when you actually get a tumor, which you see in cancer, it's actually an indication that your immune system has failed to see that weird cell and allowed that weird cell to di divide and form a tumor. So there's been a, a breakthrough in cancer treatment, which is called immunotherapy, where uh, scientists have realized that, you know, just because you have a, uh, a tumor, it doesn't mean that everything in your body is wrong. All you've just got to do is get your immune cells to see this tumor, right? And if you get them to see the tumor, the immune cells will basically go and get rid of your tumor. So every kind of cancer is not the same, right? I can have breast cancers which are slightly different, where I can have breast cancers where uh, if I can get the immune cells to see the tumor, they will get cured. So these are tumors which are called hot tumors, right? Where a tumor can somehow be visualized by the immune system. My therapeutic can somehow make my immune system see these tumors. These are hot tumors. But there are many tumors, large number of, uh, maybe the majority of tumors are actually cold tumors, where for some reason, you cannot, you simply cannot make uh, the immune system actually see that tumor, right? And so cold tumors are something which are really difficult to treat. So, um, so cancer is actually, uh, many forms of cancer are curable, but some are not, right? So now I think we are able to start thinking about DNA nano devices being able to help treat cold tumors and now make them hot, which is, now suddenly there is a way to cure these incurable cancers. All right, so how did we start out, right? So let me tell you a little bit about um, what this unusual question that we were looking at uh, at NCBS, right? So I had just joined NCBS and this, the silly question that I was asking, apparently silly question, was something motivated just out of curiosity that there's a particular kind of uh, a DNA structure that actually has four strands. Many of you have seen DNA structures that have two strands, right? Uh, but this one has four. And it's formed only when you have DNA strands that have a very, very high number of cytosines, right? And I just wanted to ask, my simple question was, why is this structure four-stranded, right? You can see there are two duplexes that have joined together their uh, molecular recognition is completely satisfied. Why does the system throw entropy out of the window and make two duplexes intercalate to form this four-stranded structure, right? And so my first student, Shovik, and I, uh, trying to ask this question, realized that this happens only under conditions where it's acidic, right? Where two cytosines can pick up a proton between them and form this very unusual base pair. And so doing that, uh, doing that study, we realized this is triggered by acidity, right? Because the cytosines have to get protonated. So because it's triggered by acidity, and normally I will not have any uh, kind of a four-stranded structure, but I add acid and then boom, I have a four-stranded structure. What, could we use such a structure to report on pH? Can we use such a structure to tell us how acidic a solution might be. Uh, when we did that, uh, so this, the, the logic that we used was very simple, which was to take a strand that had 
four such runs of, of uh, cytosines and attach a green dye on one side and a red dye on the other side. And many times, each of these dyes, if you, if you excite them, this guy will emit green fluorescence. This guy is going to emit red fluorescence. And when they are far apart, if I excite this guy, I'll only see green fluorescence because they're too far apart to actually talk to each other. But if you add acid, it's going to fold up and this guy is going to come very close to this chap. And if you design the system correctly, if you excite this guy, you will not only get green fluorescence, that green fluorescence is going to excite this chap and you will get red fluorescence as well. And so if you plot the ratio of green fluorescence to red fluorescence, then you will see that under this condition, you will have a lot of green fluorescence out here, right? You will only see this. But as you have more and more of this guy, I'll start seeing more and more red fluorescence out here. And so you will see that this actually behaves like a nice, Sensor. So this is the ratio of green to red fluorescence on this axis and on this axis is the pH, right? And so you can see that for every value of green to red fluorescence, there's a unique value of pH. So this way I can actually tell you what precisely the pH is, right? Not something which is, okay, it's sort of acidic, slightly acidic, somewhat basic, not far too acidic, right, for biological systems. So I said, okay, there goes my job. Uh, I'm not going to get tenure at this place. So I'm giving my first talk. And it was a student, a biology student uh, in the audience who later came up to me and said, you know, Yavana, actually inside organelles, uh, some organelles are known to be acidic. So you might be able to use the sensor to look at the pH of organelles at least, right? Um, and I said, oh, well, this makes sense, right? Because if you even look at our bodies, uh, we think, okay, everybody tells you physiological, P uh, your, your body's pH is 7, etc. But the pH in your stomach is 2, right? It's very acidic. So if compartments in your body have such different pH, why not compartments in a cell, right? So then I said, okay, if that's the case, can we use this to report pH inside organelles of, of, of cells? So. Uh, it turned out that we could, and here's what we looked at, right? So just the way we eat, cells also eat, right? So, and we have, like, we can divide our, uh, our uh, digestive system into different sort of putative compartments, right? Our mouths put something in, and then you, we have maybe our gullet, and then you have your tummy, right? And then you have your intestines, and all of these regions are different regions, right? And so if you look at a cell, a cell also eats. And how does it eat? It basically has a, a, a set of what are called receptors or proteins that bind different nutrients or food, right? So for example, maybe I want to uh, eat a particular nutrient like um, a, a particular hormone or a particular kind of uh, protein that the cell needs, right? So you have a receptor that will bind only one specific hormone, right? Let's say I want to bind, um, uh, okay, uh, actually let me take iron, right? So iron is actually bound to a protein called transferrin, right? And that's how our body, our cells get uh, the iron that is needed. And so transferrin, which is carrying iron inside it, goes and binds a receptor called the transferrin receptor, right? And so the transferrin receptor would be somewhere here. Transferrin is going to come and bind. It's taken inside the cell. So most of the nutrients that a cell needs comes from outside the cell, right? It binds these receptors and the receptor takes it to wherever that nutrient is supposed to go, right? So what we realized was DNA had its own receptor in cells, right? So you have a cell with a receptor that binds DNA specifically and these receptors are called scavenger receptors. What happens is the moment DNA comes and binds it, it's like I put food in my mouth, of course I chew it and then I have to swallow it, right? It's going inside me. And that's exactly what, something like that is what's happening inside the cell. The moment the receptors tickle, the cell membrane invaginates, blop, the cell basically swallows it, it becomes, goes into a little membrane bound compartment, the first organelle called an early endosome. This then matures, right? It's going down and down, down, down into the cell. 
So then it goes the late endosome and then the lysosome, right? So, and at each point, the pH inside the lumen, the lumen is the space that's contained inside the organelle, that lumen becomes more and more acidic as a function of time. So I thought, okay, let's try and see if we can use our little pH sensing device to watch an endosome acidifying in real time. And we can watch an endosome mature inside a cell as it's happening, right? That'd be super cool. So then uh, what Shovik showed was there are certain time points where the moment you added this device to cells and washed it off, you can wait a little time, just like a way you have a train that's going from, say, uh, Madras to Bangalore, uh, sorry, Chennai to Bangalore, uh, goes at very specific time points at different stations. And if you know exactly when the, when the train started, you kind of know when the train is going to be at, say, Vellore, or the, where the train is going to be at another station, right? So in a similar way, we, we found out exactly the time points. Oh, I'm so sorry, I don't know why that happened. Uh, okay. Uh, the, we were able to see exactly at specific time points uh, the acidity of an endosome maturing as a function of time. Uh, and this was actually given by our probe, right? But the interesting thing was, so here's an image of how to get, how do you get uh, an acidity map, right, of endosomes inside a cell. So what you do is you take your cell, you add your DNA device, let it, so basically you're feeding, it's like I have a buffet, you go in, everybody takes their first mouthful, then you remove the food, right? you remove everything. And then you basically watch and see how long does it take for the food to go from, from your mouth all the way to your tummy, right? You're doing that exactly for your uh, cells. Except after some time, what you do is you'll take an image in a fluorescence microscope. You'll image it in the green channel, and so then your green dye is going to light up, and you can see that this is a cell where you have endosomes that are containing your DNA device, and that's glowing in green. Do the same thing in the red channel, right? And so what you will do is, you take a ratio of this Im green intensity here divided by the intensity in red out here, take the ratio, and that's a value, and you can convert that value into a heat map. Therefore, you can get what's called a heat map out here. And in this way, you can actually look at device performance inside a live cell. How well is my uh, device able to tell me what exactly the pH is, right? And so if you look at device performance inside, say, a glass cuvette, which is shown in red, right, where here what I'm doing is I'm just taking buffer and I'm seeing what is my device response. And then I'm doing the same thing inside a cell, asking what is the pH response of this device when it's present inside a cell. It turns out that device performance is almost identical, right? And for me, this was like a hallelujah moment because I was thinking, you know, here's an artificial device, right, that I made, and you put it inside a live cell, and it's able to tell you, carry out the exact function that you asked it to carry out inside a mass, a, a cell, which has so many other components, right? It ha the cell has its own DNA, right? The cell has its own RNA. None of them are interfering with my device, right? My device is almost like a good student who goes into class, there's so much of distraction around, but he knows, the device knows, it's supposed to be doing this function. It does this function without, you know, being, I may have a rock concert, nothing. It doesn't disturb this device. It just does the function that it's supposed to do. So this is what's called an autonomous device. It is independent and carrying out the function that it has been asked to do. And so, this is what struck me, right? That you can have a man-made device is able to uh, sit in a system which has so many moving components and able to give you a particular response. So then we said, all right, this is great. I've taken somebody's cells, put them in a little Petri dish, and then I'm looking at the function of this device in a Petri dish. What about if that cell was present inside a living organism, right? Can it tell the pH inside a cell that's present inside a native, uh, in its native state? And so at this point, I'd met a geneticist 
also in NCBS. And she was working on an organism called uh, C. elegans. It's basically a soil growing worm, right? And we struck up a friendship. And uh, the moment I saw this C. elegans, it's a nice, small, transparent worm. I was hooked. I was like, I need to work on this organism. And it just so happened that at that time, there was a genetic, geneticist student called Sunena who joined me. Uh, and she said, you know, I, I really like uh, uh, the, the concept of these nano devices, but I'm a geneticist and you're a chemist. He said, any way I can work with you? And I said, you know, yes, I actually have a question. Um, and, uh, you know, you pick whichever geneticist you want to work with and I will work with that person. I want to see whether we can use genetics to show that this device can actually carry out a function inside a whole organism. And so she picked, to my joy and delight, she picked to work with uh, Sandhya Kaushika. And what Sunena showed was, when she injected this device into uh, worms, and worms are basically two tubes, <laughs> right, uh, essentially. Um, and when she injected this into a part of the worm called the pseudocelum, uh, it, it, these devices were taken up specifically by one set of cells called coelomocytes. These coelomocytes um, are basically uh, cells that are where endocytosis on, is on overdrive. They're basically eating like crazy. And our devices went into these cells also because these cells were expressing huge amounts of scavenger receptor. Right? So now our devices are like, where is the scavenger receptor present? They're going to go only to those cells. It's like I walk into a buffet a restaurant, but, uh, uh, into a buffet, but I have some kind of magnet for chicken, right, on my plate. And I take it around, and then the chicken's basically going to come straight to my plate. I don't need to go anywhere, right? So that's exactly what's happening here. Uh, the DNA is going straight to scavenger receptors, and these cells are like really endocytosing. So they end up specifically inside endosomes that are present inside coelomocytes, which are present inside C. elegans. And again, when we looked at device performance, we found that it was, um, it was as good inside a worm as inside a glass cuvette. And so I was very happy when I saw this because again, right, inside a whole organism, there's an even bigger order of magnitude in terms of the things that can go wrong. Yet this device is doing the exact function that it was programmed to do, uh, showing how autonomous it is, that it is a true reporter. So now, at this point, there was something more important to be noticed in this experiment, but at the time I failed to notice it. Uh, and this is another thing that I wanted to tell you. You don't have to understand everything about your data all at once in one go when you see it, right? You'll see a few things. Just like when you watch a movie, right? You watch one set of things, you watch it again, you see something new later, right? And so that's exactly how experiments are. The thing that I forgot to see or the thing that I did not realize would be more important would be the fact that when I injected this device inside uh, C. elegans, they went only to one particular cell type, and that was the coelomocytes. It didn't go to the neurons, it didn't go to the intestinal cells, didn't go anywhere else, just targeted only to these cells, right? But I'll, I'll come back to this uh, a, a little later. So given that they went down, if you took in, uh, DNA nano devices and you put them on cells, they go specifically to one pathway, which is this endocytic pathway that I was talking to you about. Early endosome, late endosome, lysosome. These are a series of organelles on the endocytic pathway. We asked a simple question. Okay, they are latching onto the scavenger receptor and they're going down this particular pathway. Can you reroute them? Can you send these devices to some other organelle, right? Uh, there are so many organelles inside the cell. Uh, why not go and mark something else? And if you think about it and say, well, okay, how do we reroute something, right? So if I land in, uh, say, Delhi airport, and I get onto the Ashoka University shuttle, right? I will end up at Ashoka University, right? If I end up on uh, boarding a bus that's going to uh, IIT Delhi shuttle, right? I will end up in IIT Delhi, right? So the key is, to give the device 
the right ticket to sit on the shuttle that's taking it to the right organelle. And so we asked, can you take this device now and instead of making it sit on the scavenger receptor, can we make it sit on some other receptor that will take it to some other organelle, right? Uh, and so for this, what we showed was there are two more organelles. One is the recycling endosome, and there's another one called the Golgi. And we showed that if you take these devices and you attach a, a ligand, a molecule, to your device that binds, say, the transferrin receptor. Remember I told you about the transferrin receptor, right, which carries iron. Then this device will actually sit on the transferrin receptor and it will go to another organelle called the recycling endosome. Similarly, you can take a device and attach it to a protein like furin. And furin basically goes from the Golgi to the plasma membrane and back, right? It's so wherever your protein is destined to go to, if it comes to the plasma membrane and you can make your device sit on that particular shuttle when it's at the plasma membrane, you can end up in your organelle of interest. And so then we were able to show that you could send these devices to new organelles. So the next question that we said is, okay, we know we can give these uh, devices a molecular, different molecular ticket, send them to a different organelle inside a cell. Can we now, if you remember I told you about coelomocytes here, that's the default pathway, right? Just like scavenger receptors was a default pathway. And so if I were to take uh, these devices, can I send them instead of going to the coelomocytes, can I send them to another cell, right? Can I send them to say uh, neurons or can I send them to gut cells, cells in the gut, right? Uh, and so that's what we tried to see if we could do. So we started this project with Sandhya Kaushika, but at the time they didn't work because we were using, probably we weren't, because the genetic tools at the time were slightly limiting, right? So the idea didn't work at that time. But then when I moved to University of Chicago, I reactivated this project about two or three years later with another young um, uh, worm biologist who just joined. His name is Paschalis uh, Kratzios. And the reason I'm saying this is, many times you'll have a good idea, right? But sometimes it's not possible to do for technical reasons. But when the technology, new technology comes in, sometimes the same ideas that were not possible to do earlier now become possible, right? So don't give up on an idea, just hold on to it sometimes because maybe something new will come along, right, that will enable it. And so what we did, uh, I just want to describe uh, this for you, um, because the idea itself didn't change as conceived of by Sandhya and me. We All we did was just swap to a new uh, tool. So what we, uh, what we did was, was basically put on, a, uh, found a protein that was found or made only in neurons, right? And then we attached a small other module to it that would bind our DNA devices specifically. So now what we did was in these proteins, we, these are mutant worms, in these, in these worms, we made mutant worms that were expressing a, a, a variant of this protein, right? That, oh, I made a mistake again. Uh, made, a pro, uh, made a worm that was expressing a protein that's version of this protein that's now carrying a small receptor, right, for your DNA device. Now, when you inject these worms, you'll see that it basically goes and lines uh, the neuron of, of worms. So, great. Now, we could send this to, uh, to, to neurons specifically. And even in, in neurons, you could decide which neurons you want to send it to, you know, neurons that are active to glutamate, neurons that are active towards choline, you can decide which neurons you want to send these devices to with that level of accuracy. The next thing we said was, all right, this is, you're still making sort of a mutant worm. Can you send it to some other kind of cell in a normal worm, which is not a mutant, right? And so what we did here was, at the end of the day, you need just to have the right ticket, right? So if you look at gut cells, right, 
gut cells express a particular protein called SID2. SID2 is a receptor for double-stranded RNA, right? And so what we did was we attached to this DNA devices small, a small module containing double-stranded RNA, right? And so suddenly you take the worms and take a solution of this device and then you drop the worms in this in a solution of this device. The worms are drowning, right? They go glug, 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 right? Uh, so they drink a whole lot of this device, which is now present in the gut, right? And then uh, these guys, this RNA module basically binds this new receptor, SID2, and it goes in and labels only the lysosomes. I'm so sorry you can't see it. It's because of the glare. But you can see some red dots here, I hope. And that's showing you where your DNA devices have gone to, which is very interesting because now we can see that your devices can be rerouted to a different cell type, which is now your gut cells. So when I was writing up these findings, I wanted to talk about all the different molecular technologies that are known, which when you inject them into uh, an organism, they go specifically to a cell type and in that cell type, a specific organelle, right? I found none, <laughs> which meant that this is part of a vanishingly rare set of technologies which has that level of biological precision, right? To have, what do you call, like the Amazon. I don't know whether you have Amazon uh, here where you can just, uh, you know, program something. You can say, deliver it to my house and it comes to you to your house, right? To that level of precision, we've achieved now Amazon delivery, but for biological systems. The, then I was looking, are there any other systems which are external, right? Uh, which are sort of where you can externally introduce it and, and it has this level of precision. There's only one thing that does that, and those are viruses. Viruses are the only things that can come in from the outside, right? and go to a specific tissue and infect uh, that particular tissue, but in, the, in a very specific way with organelle level precision. And so I just want to tell you that we now have a high precision delivery system that's available now uh, with uh, chemical tools. Okay, so great. I've talked to you about where you want to go if you have a DNA device. How can we get to where we want to go? The second thing is, what do you want to see when you go there? So the first we talked about was looking at pH, right? Can we map other chemicals? How about chloride, calcium, uh, and uh, sodium and potassium, other kinds of ions, right? Because it's not only pH that decides what is the milieu of an organelle. Great. So now what we did was the following which is, if you look at chemistry, chemistry has given rise to a range of molecules, which when you add on cells, they will bind you know, a specific metal ion and it will become fluorescent, right? But the problem with these small molecules is that if you add them, they'll paint the whole cell. So you won't get information from only the organelle. You can have proteins, but proteins will give you you can't get chemical information. I can see my organelle, but I can't tell you what chemicals are there inside. So with our DNA device, you can send them to a specific organelle, but if you attach this molecule that is a sensor for a specific ion out here, and you have a, ratio, a, a, a reference dye, which say glows red, then this ratio can immediately tell you what is the level of my ion that's present. Right? Because if I, if I tell you, okay, detect, detect calcium in this, right? and your calcium dye is only going to glow green, it's going to be so hard for you to see the level of green intensity and tell me what the level of my ion is. But let's say I have something which is already going to be glowing red in this bottle, right? and that red fluorescence doesn't change as a function of time but my green fluorescence is going to change in intensity depending on the amount of calcium I have inside. Then I'll be able to see something going red, orange, yellow, lime yellow, yellow, lime green, green, 
dark green, right? Then you are able to see the proportion of green to red. So our eyes are sensitive to the proportion of green to red. And this is what is called ratiometry, right? And so using that concept from my lab then came a burst of sensors to quantitate various ions, uh, reactive species like nitric oxide, hypochloric acid, uh, enzymes, the activity of enzymes inside uh, organelles, as well as membrane potential. And this only happened because all at once, there was a group of young students that joined all at the same time. And they were all, you know, sort of joyously crazy. So everybody had a crazy idea, right? Nobody was trying to compete with each other. They were all trying to make each other better. And that resulted in all of them pulling off amazing work together as a team. Uh, and I think this is also what I wanted to say, that it takes a village, right? If to think that only I will be able to do something, uh, you'll be able to get, get so far. But when you have friends around you who are able to complement your work, the kind of work that you do will be so much better. So based on that, we showed that we could actually measure the levels of so many different ions inside organelles, right? After that, we said, all right, this is great. Just because we look at um, ions inside organelles, uh, what does that mean, right? If an organelle has higher calcium or lower calcium, how is that good for the cell, right? Does it make the cell do something different, something new? And so to understand how it affected the cell, uh, we looked at a particular organelle called the lysosome. So the lysosome does for the cell what the stomach does for our bodies, right? So basically the lysosome digests material uh, inside the cell and makes these nutrients available for the cell to grow. So, but uh, the lysosome is an, is, an, uh, is an organelle which is spherical. Most of the time it's like a ball, right? But in immune cells like macrophages or dendritic cells or, or, uh, or neutrophils, these immune cells when they get activated, right, the lysosome will become tubular, which is really weird. A lot of people have seen this, but they've never been able to understand why a lysosome tubulates, right? Why does the cell need two different shapes of the same organelle? At the end of the day, the organelle has the same kinds of proteins. It has the same kind of... Uh, of a uh, membrane. The membrane is not changing. So why is it that I have to have an organelle of a new shape? And so Bhavya was trying to send uh, our DNA devices to an organelle called the ER, uh, endoplasmic reticulum. But what she found, and this is also something to bear in mind, that there are a lot of accidents that happen. And sometimes accidents are not bad <laughs> because they'll teach you something new. And what she found was, while she was trying to send DNA nano devices to the endoplasmic reticulum, she found that instead they were going to the lysosomes and tubulating the lysosomes by activating a specific pathway inside the cell. She found out how it tubulated lysosomes and instead what she did after that was on this device attach sensors for calcium and pH. What she found was when, these, when the, the lysosomes tubulated, there was a pH gradient from one end of the tubule to the other end. And in the opposite direction, there was a calcium gradient from one end of the tubule to the other. And so these gradients had been previously predicted by other scientists in Canada. And when Bhavya found it, I thought, okay, this is likely to be an artifact. It's not real. But Bhavya did many experiments and showed me that these gradients were actually real. And then we, I, I said, like, how is this possible? And then later we found out that there was this prediction that was made uh, a long time ago that we hadn't read about, right? But we had found it uh, 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 in our systems. So that was the first experimental prediction of uh, experimental uh, evidence of something that had been theoretically uh, postulated. So at this point, we said, all right, this is great. We can see that there are two different, you know, the, the environment inside these tubular lysosomes was very, very different from 
uh, from these vesicular ball-like lysosomes, which probably means that, and further, I think if you're looking at the digestive capacity, the tubular lysosomes are not as digestive as, they, not, they don't have the capacity to digest as vesicular lysosomes do. And so we said, all right, this is great. They, these two things are actually performing very, very different functions. In fact, um, uh, so the environment inside them is different. But does this change anything about the cell in which it is present? And what we found was the following, that uh, if you, uh, so, so we tried to see whether the organelle state is somehow coupled to the cell state. What does this mean? People know that a cell has different functions. For example, if I take your immune cell, an uh, immune cell under normal conditions is, is called an immune cell in the resting state, right? Nothing is, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's like you guys here, right, uh, in the resting state. Now, if it is starving, right, if it doesn't get any food, it gets activated into a state that is called an autophagic state. It starts eating. You're basically fast, the cell, you're making the cell do fasting, right? So the cell starts eating uh, food that's present inside the cell, right? Uh, and this is a completely different state. It's called the autophagic state, right? It's self-eating. Uh, but if the cell um, goes and uh, is, contacts um, a bacterium or uh, a pathogen, a virus, right? Any one of these uh, uh, disease-causing uh, bacteria, what happens is that the cell becomes activated. It will do everything in its power to swallow the pathogen and digest the hell out of it, right? And just uh, uh, cut it to bits, right? And this is how we are able to survive because our immune cells become what's called inflamed, right? And in each case, the cell basically knows that it has to clear the infection or it has to eat up, uh, it has to eat up um, sort of um, uh, it's a food in order to survive this fasting state. And both these states are different, right? If you're sitting here with a full stomach, you're, you're, you're in your resting state. If you're sitting and you're really hungry, you're in a fasting state. If you're sitting and you're fighting an enemy, you're in the inflamed state. And you can see that all these states are different states of the same cell, right? And your organelles, everybody knows so far, your organelles rise to meet the challenge. Your organelle state changes so that it can support the cell's overall function. So now the question is, this is interesting. The cell takes a decision, the organelle decides to follow. If we can send a DNA device into an organelle inside a cell and we send a message to the organelle, can the organelle tell the cell what to do, right? Is there a hotline between organelle state and cell state? Is it always that it has to start with the cell taking a decision and then the organelle is responding? Or can you tickle the organelle and change the cell state, right? And at this point, we said, okay, we are sending devices to lysosomes. We can tell lysosomes, okay, tubulate now, right? Does it change cell behavior? Can we send the right message to a cell to make it do what we want it to do? And so, remember I told you that we can tubulate lysosomes. What turned out to happen, and Bhavya found, uh, I told her, just see, when you tubulate the lysosome, does the cell act as if it's starving? Or does the cell act as if it's inflamed and ready to attack a pathogen? Turned out neither was the case, right? So we were very disappointed. Uh, and this is another thing, right? Everything doesn't have to happen in a way which you think. So Bhavya brought back the data to me and we were looking at it carefully and we realized that the cell was not getting autophagic, the cell, neither was it getting inflamed, but the cell was nicely gulping and it, the cell became far more hungry. It was taking in vast amounts of material from the outside compared to a resting cell, right? So just imagine, I don't need to be hungry, I can simply just keep eating even if I am not hungry, 
right? So this was a very interesting thing uh, because just by changing the organelle state, you could change cell behavior, right? And so uh, at this point, we said, all right, if we can change cell behavior as we wish, can we change cell behavior in the context of a disease, right? So when this was happening, you know, we were thinking about these things. On the floor above us was a professor called Lev Becker, who's a cancer biologist. And he was looking at the difference between two kinds of cells. So in our immune cells, we have a particular kind of immune cell called a macrophage. And macrophage comes in two flavors. One is the M1 type and the other is the M2 type. So let me tell you a story about M1 and M2. Two kinds of people, two kinds of cells, right? One kind is uh, the M1 kind. These guys are loud mouths. I call them loud mouths, right? So macrophage is something which a big eater. Macro is big. Phage means eat. So these cells, their job is they are professional eaters. They eat everything, right? Uh, including uh, pathogens and viruses. They'll just engulf it, take it inside, digest it. Nobody knows about it. So the loudmouths are, are cells. Their job is they'll engulf something. They'll digest it into a little, not very little pieces, you know, sort of digest it. And then they'll puke it out and rub it all over their, uh, their surface. Right? To tell T cells and B cells, look who I ate, look what I ate, right? look what I found. And in this way, they train our T cells and B cells to recognize pathogens and destroy them. Right? So M1 cells are cells which are there to recognize pathogens. Right? All right, what are M2 cells? These are killer, right? silent fellows. They'll take something eat it, digest the hell out of it, and shred it into amino acids, right? So nobody knows what they ate. So these cells are, shh, I don't want anybody to know what I just ate. And that is because they ate self. So sometimes what happens is your own cells die, right? If your own cells die and macrophages eat them, you don't want to generate an immune response because then your T cells and B cells will go around trying to attack parts of your own organs. You want your T cells and B cells to only go and attack pathogens. So you should not train your T cells and B cells to recognize yourself, right? So that is why you have to destroy anything which sort of died because of natural reasons inside you. Because if they are hanging around, that's also not good for you, right? You don't want junk to be hanging around. So there are these two types of cells, and they are both important because they both do important things for the body. OK, so remember I told you cancer happens when something uh, strange happens to your immune system, and actually the development of a tumor is, uh, is a clear result that your immune system failed, right? It's a failure of your immune system. OK, so what Lev was trying to do is, what is the difference between M1 macrophages and M2 macrophages? And he found that there were, in M2 macrophages, they had a very high level of a particular protein called catepsin. And these are digesters. They digest the hell out of uh, anything that comes into the lysosome. And catepsins are found in the lysosome, okay? So what happened, is the following. Lev came to me and said, Yamuna, I think I found the difference between M1 and M2 macrophages. I think these guys have higher catepsin. Do you have a device that can help me show uh, the activity of catepsins and show that it's in the lysosome? So I said, that's fantastic. We have a device that can do exactly that. We sent it to the lysosomes of M1 macrophages and M2 macrophages, and we showed that in M2 macrophages, they just lit up like Christmas trees, right? Showing that there was such high activity in lysosome. And M1 also had, but not that much. Okay, great. This point, Lev said, hey Yamuna, can you make something that will inhibit the activity of catepsins? So we send DNA devices to the lysosome, but now they have an inhibitor 
that's going to bind and deactivate catepsins. So I said, okay, this is not happening. Already I've given you, uh, you know, a catepsin, uh, something that will tell you the activity and measure it. But, you know, interfering with a, with a biological process, you know, you're talking about therapeutics here. I don't think it's going to work because there are so many things that can go wrong, right? If I want to get an idea of, if I want to, let's say a war is happening. If I want to get a reporter, right, uh, that's going to tell me about the war, I have to just send a couple of molecules there, right? And then I'll be able to get the information. But if you're asking me to solve the war, then I have to send a battalion over there. I can't do that, right? It, it, you have to decide the number of devices to send, and they all have to go to only macrophages in one place, not everywhere else. How do you know? Like, every organ has macrophages. My brain has macrophages. Liver has macrophages. Every given organ has macrophages sitting. If I inject a device, I have no guarantee that it's going to go to the macrophages that are present inside a tumor, right? They should be <laughs> going everywhere. So I told Lev, please go. You know, this is not going to work. You don't have enough data. So credit to Lev, he didn't give up. He went and what he, what he, his logic was the following, that I have a tumor, more than 50% of the cells are macrophages. They are all M2 macrophages. So when a tumor cell dies, these macrophages are unable to tell uh, T cells and B cells, come here, these tumor cells are, are actually not good for the body, you need to get rid of them, because these guys are the shh guys, right? And so what he said was, if we, if we put in some breaks, right, on the lysosome's capacity to digest, then what will happen is, they'll start behaving a little like M1 macrophages, they're like, half digest, it's like I put rocks in your stomach and then send you to a buffet, right? How much can you eat, right? So you basically are making these cells um, not digested that much and put the antigens on the surface, right? Tell the system that, look, I ate uh, these kinds of cancerous cells and that then trains your T cells and B cells to come, identify that these are cancer cells and kill the entire, and get rid of the tumor. And so, Lev went and got genetic proof of that. And by that time, when he showed me this data, I think my students had seen the data before me. Without telling me, I think they already made the device that had an inhibitor. They already injected it. <laughs> and I think Lev came to me to show me the data because they had already done the experiment. Uh, and so never in a month of Sundays would I have predicted that there are some things, so this is why now we have this policy of just do the experiment, don't over-rationalize, right? So what they found was if they take this device, here you have the inhibitor to the catepsin, here is a fluorescent molecule so that you can follow the device and see where it is. And we found that when you injected this into, a, into the a vein of mouse, it goes straight to only the macrophages that are present inside tumor. And even when it goes to macrophages, it goes only to the lysosomes inside the macrophages. And after that, whatever Lev said would happen, happened. The macrophages were, failed to digest the antigens fully. They were able to present it on the surface of uh, the macrophage. They trained the tumor cells, uh, the T cells, to see the tumor, T cells came and got rid of the tumor. And you can see that that's exactly what, you're looking at tumor size here. Under normal conditions, your tumor is going to grow really big. If you add your DNA to it, uh, your DNA nano device to it, you will see that the tumor is even like failed to grow. And people who've been in cancer for a while are very excited by seeing this. Uh, which, sorry, which actually works in um, uh, three different kinds of tumors, lung uh, cancers, um, uh, breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer, as well as skin cancers. And so given this, where you have tumors that are actually not responsive to immunotherapy, you now have a device that will take that tumor and make it visible to your body's own immune system, where your immune cells can now come 
and get rid of your tumor. So I, many of you will come across, if not in this year, but you'll come across in your subsequent years, something called targeted drug delivery. This is a very big area of research. Targeted drug delivery is important because, let's say I have, um, I don't know, uh, a tumor in my breast, right? If I go and I take chemotherapy, I'm having medicines that go everywhere, where it, and it will have an action on cells which are, which are good, as well as cells which are bad, right? And so as a result, I will have a lot of off-target effects. I'll have effects not just to kill my breast cells, but also my hair will all drop out. Hair cells are all, uh, are all dead as well, right? There's so many other things that it will hit. And so many times you have to ask yourself, if I have a disease, is it worth it to take this cure, right? Which completely goes and kills all my good cells as well. And so there's this new area that has started, which is called targeted drug delivery, where they send um, uh, a medication specifically to the area that is affected, right? So instead of carpet bombing, you send a guided missile that goes to one place and takes out that one room in that one apartment, right? So that is, uh, and this has basically changed, um, you know, uh, uh, the area of medicine. It, they've, been, they've used it for uh, liver disease, they've used it for various cancers and, and airway diseases, etc. So now I want you to think of, I've just told you that you can control cell behavior by sending devices by organelle, by manipulating organelles. There is a hotline between organelle and cell behavior, right? Where if you can manipulate an, what the information that's going to an organelle, you can change what the cell is doing, right? If that's the case, and we also know that organelles are responsible for a whole variety of cellular processes. So now you can start thinking about ways by which you can change what the cell is doing, both in a healthy cell as well as in a diseased cell. But at the same time, you can also send a therapeutic, right, to a specific organelle in a specific cell. So now you can start thinking about a new area which is hyper-specific delivery to organelles, right? So you have now been able to not just take out a specific uh, apartment in a set of buildings, right? Instead of carpet bombing the whole city, I was telling you that you can take out a building. You can start thinking about taking out the study table in a particular uh, apartment that's pre present in a particular building. It's very, very specific, right? Therefore, you would probably need even less amount of medication. Right? That uh, is actually useful for the body. So I just want to say at this point that we've reached this place where I'm talking about medication, I'm talking about quality of life, I'm talking about using less to, but it's more effective to achieve, um, you know, treatment. But I never set out to do this. I just set out to ask a very simple question, which was, why did a particular kind of DNA structure form, right? And it's, and it's not easy to, to actually anticipate where you'll end up. But I think a consequence of where you end up, it's always useful to look back and ask where you started, right? So even, and this is how research always goes, right? You don't know how something is going to be useful. Therefore, the importance of research is to make sure that some people want to start out doing things which are useful and some people not so, right? But I think it's really important to understand that at the end of the day, all kinds of research is important, right? Because it, the key is, where do you go, right? And so with that, I'm just going to say that we, um, in order to solve big problems, we have to start seeing cells like the way cell biologists always have with all of their organelles, because this is how you can actually control the cell in addition to simply understanding how the cell works. Um, most of this work, it was very difficult to get funding for it in the early days. Uh, even up to last year, I didn't have a single grant from uh, the federal, uh, federal agencies. And that is another thing, as you grow up and you do research, 
you may or may not find support. Just because you don't find support, it doesn't mean it's not worth it. Now, we have so much money, we can't, we don't know what to do with it, right? But the point is, there was a time when there was nothing. And the key is, if you kind of understand where you're going, you know, it's going to be a little difficult, but don't give up, right? That's the, that's the key thing. So I will stop there. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer it. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor, for such a nice talk. So I'm Bharti. I'm PhD first year student uh, at Ashoka. So I have actually three questions. Sorry. So my first question is, since you were sending your devices to the organities that can digest so many things, how these de uh, devices like uh, protected themselves from those machineries? Wonderful question. So this is also something extremely important to understand, right? For example, why don't I digest myself from inside? <laughs> why doesn't my stomach digest itself? So everything gets digested. So when you actually put your devices in, they will also get digested, right? Um, but the thing is, it takes time to digest. You have every device has a half-life, right? So provided you know what the half-life is, then you can make your measurement before it gets degraded and then you come out. So one of the things that we do is, first thing we do is measure the half-life of the device. Turns out that usually it's anywhere between 6 hours to 12 hours depending on the system. Once you know the half-life, you know exactly when to measure, right? Um, so the important thing to remember is, it's actually a little like, have you seen Mission Impossible, right? The guy gets this message, he reads it and poof, it begins. That's roughly what we are doing. Okay. Yeah, so my second question was related to this only, since uh, you want to use these uh, devices for personal, uh, personalized medication. So like for in the case of drug discovery, we look for admit properties of any drug, like the adsorption, adsorption distribution yeah. and everything. So like how these get excreted from the system ultimately. and. I think it's how do these things get excreted from the system so this is something that we still don't know yet how do how does how does the system get rid of them because these are basically made from biological material it's our own DNA right I mean it's not our own I mean it's DNA that's molecularly indistinguishable from our own DNA so what happens is that the this is what I think the lysosome basically digests it up into nucleotides right, into little bits. Then it's recycled into the cytoplasm and the cell likely stitches it up into new DNA, right, into the cell zone forms of DNA. So it sort of gets integrated into the system. And I think the fluorescent probes are what is metabolized and, and thrown out, but we have to follow that. I think we haven't done that yet, the ADME properties, yeah. And also like uh, at the time when you were studying these devices in C. elegans, so you said, uh, so these were not specific, so specific at that time, I'm guessing, right? Um, they, they were doing what they were doing. However, I mean, they were, let's say they were pH reporters. They'll, they'll actually be pH reporters. But if they go into a, a, depending on what cell type it goes to, we couldn't control which cell type it went to. They went to a specific default cell. Yeah, so my question was like, when you were sending these devices to neurons, yes. But uh, first, you saw that these were going to coelomocytes, right? Yes. So, like, did you also check like how much percentage of these devices was going to the neurons and how much to the coelomocyte? Yes. The so they couldn't go to neurons at all. They went hundred percent to coelomocytes, right? So when it went hundred percent to coelomocytes, we then asked, all right, can we reroute and send them to neurons? But you're right that we got them to go to neurons, but like 10 to 20% would still go to coelomocytes, right? So you can't completely send it to uh, neurons, but you can dramatically shift how much goes to neurons. Thank you so much. Yes. Good afternoon, ma'am. My name is Kalpana. I'm from Delhi NCR. 
could you more discuss about the point mutation or the substitution mut mutation relation to the uh, immu immune cells that you talked in the uh, previous slides? So in what context do you want to ask this question? I'm just trying to understand what you would like to like me to talk about specifically. Point mutation and immune cells. So a point mutation is where uh, an immune cell has a specific mutation in a specific protein that causes the immune cell to change its behavior, right? And that is a genetic uh, way by which uh, the body generates diversity of immune response, right? Um, in the case of our DNA devices, they are not introducing any kinds of point mutation. Instead, what they're doing is they're going and creating a change in an organelle, and that organelle is making your immune cell behave differently, right? But immune cells can behave differently if they acquire a mutation in a single location, in a single site, at a, in a particular protein, and that can also change immune cell behavior. But that is going to be less, more rare, uh, and can happen spontaneously. Right? Whereas when you want this to happen like now, 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 you need a targeted uh, change in cell behavior for therapeutic action, then you need a, a DNA device. Thank you, ma'am. Yes. Just a clarification question from my side. Uh, you said that the lysosomes tend to become tubular and their digestive capacity decreases. Yes. But then when you artificially made them tubular, didn't they become more hungry? So they became more hungry, but their digestive capacity decreased. Exactly. So this is a very, very good question, right? So what am I swallowing more when I cannot digest it, right? So this is why when we've looked at so when does a system form tubular lysosomes, right? Uh, a system forms tubular lysosomes when A, it is in the starving state, autophagic state, or it's in the inflamed state where I have to just take in more back. But every time I have to study a tubular lysosome, I have to study it in the context of autophagy. I have to study it in the context of inflammation. And both these have so many other pathways that uh, upregulated, I don't know specifically what my tubular lysosome is doing. But now we know that what a tubular lysosome is doing is it's pushing the plasma membrane out so that the cell can swallow more. So that is the function of a tubular lysosome. It makes the cell more gulpy, right? Because if I have to study uh, the, the context of, uh, imagine I want to study the uh, what is a gun doing, right? And I only, every time I see guns, there's warfare, right? So I'm unable to understand what is the function of a gun if I, but then the problem is I also have warfare going on. So I have so many things, right? So I need to have a, a way by which I can study the function of a gun without warfare. That's what is happening. <coughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, I have a yes, question. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for such a wonderful talk. Uh, I have two questions. My first question is, what is it about the DNA in the nano device that is giving it specificity? Like, is there something about DNA? That is a beautiful question. <coughs> so, I don't have COVID. It's just like I'm, I've, I've been talking a lot and my throat is dry. Uh, <coughs> apologies for the coughing. So, um, you actually can get away with roughly any sequence of DNA, right? If I take DNA from, so the reason why, you know, uh, people didn't try this earlier was because everybody thought that DNA will cause an inflammation response, right? And the reason is all the DNA that comes from outside is usually coming from pathogens, right? Bacterial DNA and bacterial DNA which is coming from pathogens, actually has some specific methylations or some specific CPG motifs and things like this that the cell has realized is actually not human in nature, 
or mammalian in nature. It's coming from a pathogen. So it is pathogenic DNA that actually makes the cell give you an immune response. But we, again, this is a little bit of luck, right? We, we didn't, I didn't know all this. I was a chemist. I just started in a biology. I was like, yeah, I can use DNA. So I used DNA without thinking that it was actually self DNA. It was DNA that was bog standard DNA that ha did not have any of these pathogen signatures. So you can basically use any sequence of DNA as long as it's double stranded and that is practical to make. So we use DNA that has 30 to 40 base pairs length and it's just simple DNA that you can use as like a primer for PCR or something like that. It doesn't have any pathogenic signatures. So what happens is that the cell just thinks that it's normal DNA that is so when a cell next to uh, an immune cell goes pop and dies, the biggest thing that's released is DNA. So that's why you have these scavenger receptors to basically clean up this DNA in your body, right? And so our DNA devices are basically using that mechanism. And immune cells all the way from worms all the way to us, this is their function, just to sort of sweep off and collect all DNA that is from dead and dying cells send it to the lysosome, the lysosome will digest it for the cell and the cell is happily growing and, uh, uh, and, and that's, that's what it's used for. So there's nothing special in the sequence of DNA. In fact, there shouldn't be, otherwise then you'll have an immune response. Uh, so my second question is related, like if I give a specific sequence to this DNA, let's say I take mitochondrial DNA, yeah. can it be targeted to mitochondria or can it be targeted to chloroplast? Ah. Specific so, organelle set. This is a beautiful question, right? So the 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 motive of the question is, how do I target mitochondria and chloroplasts, which are different organelles and completely different from um, uh, so the endocytic organelles or TGN. Or, so all I can say is, at the moment, we can't use double-stranded DNA to target. Or mitochondria or chloroplast, you have to use some other mechanism. And the reason is the following. If you look at the two organelles that are hardest to target, one is the nucleus and the other is the mitochondria. And they both contain DNA, right? And the reason that they have, and they both have two membranes around them. And the reason they have this is because every cell needs to sort of protect its identity, right? It doesn't want to let its own DNA like go out by mistake or let some other wacko DNA just come in and infiltrate, right? So they're actually guarded by two membranes to prevent this. However, there are ways by which one can circumvent this. We can talk more about it a little later, but you can't use it using this technology. Can't get there using this technology, okay? Good afternoon, ma'am. Ma'am, I'm Earth from New Delhi. I want, I had two questions, ma'am. First of all, like you were detecting uh, various minerals like calcium and pH. So like, were you using some solution or you were using some technology with some sensors and all that? So the first thing that we do is, you have to see, do I have a sensor, right? Even before I put it into a living cell, I need to understand what level of ion can I detect with this sensor? So for that, I have to use it in a simple solution. I'll take a bottle of water, <laughs> I'll dissolve my relevant amount of, of calcium or whatever, and see, is my sensor able to detect nanomolar of calcium, or is it uh, weak enough to detect micromolar calcium or millimolar calcium, right? So that test I have to do uh, in vitro, in simple solutions, to understand what is the concentration range that my sensor can detect. Right? Once I know that concentration range, then I can put it inside a cell and see whether my, uh, my sensor lights up. And if so, is it in the micromolar range? Is it in the nanomolar range? In the millimolar range? Because I have already calibrated it in a solution of varying levels of ion. Got it, ma'am. And the second doubt is, ma'am, like what is the real difference between the targeted drugs and uh, like the normal drugs that you're talking about? Yes. So targeted, the, the targeted drugs, how they reach a particular tissue of interest is the following. Every tissue, the, 
the cells will express certain kinds of receptors, right? So if I take my drug and I attach it to a small molecule that binds that receptor, wherever, so let's say this is in uh, my stomach, right? Uh, my stomach cells are expressing this receptor. If I take the drug, the plain drug, and inject it, it will go everywhere, right? But if I take the same drug and attach it to a molecule that binds that receptor that's present in my stomach cells, it will go everywhere. But only at my stomach cells it will get concentrated up. It's the same way that you might want to think about if I have a dabba and I just, and this room is full of flies and I show this dabba out, it's like, and I take a, 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 a sort of a, a, a lid and I close it. The concentration of flies in that dabba will be the same as the concentration of flies in the room. But if I put some honey, right, in the dabba and I keep it open like this, yes, there'll be flies flying around everywhere, but they will get concentrated up on the face of the dabba, right? And then I close it, right? I have more number of flies inside my dabba. So you want to think about your receptors as specific honey that will get the flies that are the drug. Right? That is targeted drug delivery. Okay, uh, so uh, sorry for interruption, but we are running short on time. We have only 10 minutes left, so maybe we can wrap up this in quick haste. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now we can take uh, three, four questions. Yeah, right now. Yeah. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for the lecture. I really enjoyed it. Uh, my question was related to the macrophages. So you had said that the M21s, they eat their own dead cells uh, so that the M1s don't get a sense of like hostility for them. Yes. Has there ever been a case where an M1 cell has actually eaten an M2 cell? And if not, what do you think would happen if um, one did? Hmm. So a slight difference between M1 and M2, right? M2 cells, you should think of them as like sentinels for the body, right? So an M1 cell will actually eat anything that is usually not, uh, let's say, so my M1 cells will eat anything that is not a cell from my body, right? It will eat a virus, a pathogen, a fungus, anything that it comes into contact with. If it's not my kind of cell, it will eat that, right? And then show out the uh, traces of whatever it ate on the cell surface so that your it can teach your T cells, here, recognize this, this is a fungus, or recognize this, it's a, you know, it's a tuberculosis bacteria. Then you will have an immune response. M2 cells, the function of M2 cells is very interesting. Why do they exist, right? So imagine I have, I went and banged my hand somewhere, right? And I have a blood clot because my, my vein got damaged, some cells died, and they're everywhere, right? And so if I don't repair that, I'll bleed to death internally, right? So the system, what it does is it forms a clot, a blood clot inside. So M2 cells will basically go, they'll see this blood clot. It's not, they're still cells that are made from me, right? They are not pathogenic cells. They are not cells which are bacteria or virus or anything. So these M2 cells job is to go and eat up the clots so that it can, your blood can flow properly, right? So that's the reason why M2 cells exist. They exist to eat up these small things where sometimes you have your own dead cells that are present, right? But the problem inside a tumor is that you basically want your immune cells to see these wacko cells that have gone, become cancerous, but they are your cells, right? And so your M2 cells are not getting rid of these tumor cells, right? It keeps telling the system, look, you know, it's a wound. Don't come here, I'm taking care of it, right? What you want is to make an M M2 cell behave like an M1 cell, right? Which is to eat the tumor and then show it out and then tell the T cells, you know, these are actually wacko cells that are part of your own body, come and clear them. So it's not like M1 becomes M2, although it would be, people are trying to do that now, trying to take an M1 cell and make it behave like an M2 cell, or take an M2 cell and make it behave like an M1 cell. Um, 
Over here, what we've done is that we've taken an M2 cell and tried to make it become, behave like an M1 cell. It's not become an M1 cell, it's behaving like an M1 cell, right? Uh, so, but this is an active area of research where people are trying to make M2 cells behave like the other kind uh, or M1 cells and behave like an M2. Thank you. That's a great question. Yes. Yeah. Good afternoon, ma'am. Ma'am, this is Panya Chaudhary from Mumbai. Ma'am, I had a question. It is a it is quite an intermediate question, but ma'am, how does the drug identify whether tumor is? That's a very good question, right? Depends on the kind of drug you're using. If your drug is a small molecule, it doesn't have a brain, right? It's, it's just going to go to every kind of cell. And then once it goes into a cell, whether it's a good cell or a bad cell, uh, it, will, it will carry out its function over there. So let's say we are talking about a drug like small molecule drug like cisplatin. What cisplatin will do is it will go and intercalate with your DNA, cause the cell toxicity, and because your DNA has accumulated a lot of cisplatin, your, your cell can't work anymore and it dies. So the whole point of many of these small molecule drugs is that they'll basically go get into a cell and kill the cell, right? And so when you're talking about a small molecule, it goes everywhere and it'll kill good cells and it'll kill bad cells. But the reason we do it is because cancer cells are growing so fast. They're growing 10 times as fast as, you know, a normal cell. So if you're basically trying to tell all, kill all cells, I have more good cells than I have bad cells. So my good cells are likely going to survive. And the ones that are going to be most affected are the cells that are growing fastest and they will die. And the logic is, I'll therefore kill all my bad cells. I'll still have some good cells left, right? That's, those are the dumb dyes, right? Or dumb uh, uh, drugs. But smart drugs, or drugs that don't do that, we can put on signals that will either tell them, okay, go to this particular organ and kill cells in this organ. That way I lose good cells in that organ as well as bad cells in that organ, cancer cells in that. That's another way. The third way is what I just showed you, which is don't kill the cell, just change what it's doing and biology will take care of the rest, right? So there's nothing wrong with my T cells and my B cells. They are there and willing to help. They just don't know where to go. And what you're doing here, this particular drug, is all it's doing is it's changing the behavior of an M2 macrophage, making it an M1 macrophage. So I haven't killed the cell by any means. I've changed it. It's now carrying out a different function and the rest of biology just takes care of it. The reason why you don't get cancer and I'm not get can getting cancer even though our cells are mutating, that mechanism is, is, uh, is operational even in a person who has a, 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 you know, a, a tumor. It's just that their cells don't know where to go. So all these smarter drugs are doing is just telling the cells where to go. Right? Come here and get me. 